Good evening, everyone. This is a lecture on the Assyrians during the Neo-Babylonian and Achaemenid Empire. This period of time is a very critical time for understanding the continuity of Assyrian history. It's often thought that Assyrians, by many historians in the past especially, that Assyrians disappeared after the fall of their empire and that there was, in fact, no trace of them left during the Neo-Babylonian and Achaemenid empires, or Persian Empire, which was destroyed by Alexander, uh, known as Alexander the Great. Now, why would historians think that Assyrians disappeared after the fall of Assyria? It's because once the Assyrian state was destroyed, seemingly in, in recorded history, it never really recovered. And so the understanding that many historians had was that once the Assyrian state went away, in fact, the Assyrian people went away. And one of the reasons that some historians, of course, not all, and in particular, historians in the past, less historians recently, and archeologists recently, but historians in the past. One of the reasons that historians in the past have felt that Assyrians disappeared is because of the appearance of this term Syriac and Syrian rather than Assyrian. And it's disassociation from the history and the culture of Assyria. So today we're going to examine that term. Where does it originate? How did it originate? And whether it really is an indication that the word Syrian or Syriac is a reflection, is a um, connection to the word Assyrian. We're also going to look at that. The period of time we're talking about is approximately 609 to 333 BC. 609 is the period where the Assyrian king Ashur Ubadit II is battling the Medes, uh, the Sumerians, the Scythians, and the Neo Babylonians, as they're known, and is defeated in the city of Haran. And we're going to talk about that. And 333 BC is the time the Achaemenid Empire, otherwise known as the Persian Empire, falls to Alexander, known as Alexander the Great. We need to understand the last kings of Assyria here. Between the year 631, after the death of the great Ashurbanipal, king of Assyria, 631 and 627 BC, Assyria is ruled by Ashur Itil Ilani, a very or relatively short reign. And then Sin Shar Ushkun, who rules in the year 627 to 612 BC. At the same time that this king is ruling, Sin Shumu Lisha also rules. He is thought to be ruling in the south of uh, Mesopotamia in the southern area of the Assyrian Empire in Mesopotamia proper. He's also thought to be a eunuch, meaning he is not a descendant of kings, but thought to be an Assyrian general who was loyal to the Assyrian king, but became disloyal. Um, although this fact and this particular person, we do not know much about historically. We know that the last Assyrian king, the very last Assyrian king, who is oftentimes described as a prince, is Ashur Ubalat II. And the reason he is not described as a king is because he was not consecrated as king in the city of Ashur, in the temple of Ashur, the god Ashur, the supreme god of Assyria where all of the kings of Assyria 
were consecrated by tradition, going back, of course, thousands of years. So Ashur Ubanit the second takes reign in 609, um, or takes reign, excuse me, in 612 BC after the fall of the city of Nineveh, when it is thought that Sin Shar Ushkun of Assyria, the very last king, is killed in the city of Nineveh. Ashur II takes reign and continues uh, to fight for the survival of Assyria and is defeated in the city of Haran, which is in today's Turkey, southeastern Turkey. And this is the last capital of the state of Assyria. And that's the end of the Assyrian state as we knew it. And in the last class, we described the major transformation that occurred not only in the Assyrian heartland, but throughout the ancient Middle East, throughout the ancient Near East and North Africa, because of the fall of this incredible empire, the largest empire that had ruled this part of the world, indeed any part of the world, the most organized empire. The impact was a tremendous impact, but it was particularly tremendous in the center of power, in the economic, political, military center of the Assyrian Empire. And so this had a devastating impact, not only on the structure of the Assyrian Empire and the Assyrian state, which ruled in the center in Nineveh specifically, and then later in Haran, but also on the Assyrian people. The Assyrian people no longer are going to rule with the tremendous influence that they had for centuries, for many, many centuries, from the center. They are no longer going to economically impact the world from the center of the Assyrian heartland. And this, of course, changes everything. Now, the style of the Assyrian rulers towards the end of Assyrian rule is pretty much textually, historically, archaeologically. It's pretty much the same as all of the Assyrian kings that had ruled before. So Assyrian kings in the past um, had a certain style of speaking, a certain style of writing that we are going to um, sort of see repeated in the Persian or Achaemenid Empire to show the continuity um, Assyrianized continuity, if you will, of the Persians who came after the Assyrians. And here we see one of the inscriptions, which is rather rare for this Assyrian king. Why is it rare? Because it is thought that towards the end of the Assyrian Empire, very few texts have survived, partly because of the widespread destruction, in particular, of the centers of power, which means the palaces of the Assyrian Empire. And so in terms of artistic and literary expressions, we do not have much from this period, but we do have um, the Assyrian king here explaining that he is the great king, mighty king, king of the universe, king of Assyria, and so on, the son of Ashurbanipal, the great king, the mighty king. This is very typ typical of the rhetoric of the Assyrian empire during this time, and it's also going to be the rhetoric of those who inherit the Assyrian Empire, as we will see later. What was the Neo-Babylonian Empire? So I'm going to make some comments here about the rule of the Neo-Babylonian Empire that came after the Assyrian Empire. A couple of things I'm going to say here. Um, the first is that the Neo-Babylonian Empire was not known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire II the king of Babylon. Um, it was known as the kingdom of Akkad. The reason it was known as the kingdom of Akkad is because the area known as Babylonia was really referred to as Akkad. So one could, I guess, call it the Akkadian Empire, but it's not called that. So we'll just go along with the way historians understand this period of Mesopotamian history and use the term Neo-Babylonian. But I just want you to be very clear 
that this is not a term that the people, the natives of Babylon used themselves. Certainly not a, uh, a term that the king of Babylon used. Another term that was not used, and oftentimes it is confused with this period of time, is the Chaldean period. The term Chaldean was certainly not used by any of the kings known as the Neo-Babylonian kings. Not by Nebuchadnezzar, not by Nebuchadnezzar, not by any of these kings. Not by Nebuchadnezzar, the very last king who falls to the Persian Empire. This was a very short-lived period of history for the Mesopotamian empires. It was 70-some years certainly compared to the Assyrian Empire, which ruled for over 700 years, this period is a very short-lived period. It is thought by many historians to be simply the end period of the Assyrian rule, prior to it being inherited by the Persians or the Achaemenids. So the Neo-Babylonian Empire does not really, in terms of identity, represent a Neo-Babylonian people as such. And it does not represent the Chaldean people as such. It represents a period where Akkad, the area in southern Mesopotamia, began to rule through the kings who were resident in Babylon. I also want to say something about the Median Empire. The Medes who assisted in the destruction of Assyrian cities have really no trace, administrative trace, in Mesopotamia. We, as archaeologists, have yet to find any trace of the rule of the Medes or any trace of any type of empire that we can call the Median Empire, such as you see on the map here. So we, we really do not have any evidence that something like the Median Empire actually existed. Sort of strange, because the reference to the Medes is often heard by many people. Uh, especially in the Bible. But there is really no trace, archaeological trace, textual trace, or textual evidence of something called the Median Empire. We just don't have it. Certainly nothing compared to the Neo-Babylonian or especially to the um, Neo-Assyrian period. Nothing like that. So, Knowing that there was this empire in southern Mesopotamia, what did this mean for the Assyrians? Well, the Assyrians appear in various inscriptions during this time. So those who think that the fall of Assyria meant the disappearance of the Assyrian people, certainly the evidence during this time between 609 and 539, 539 representing the fall of Babylon to Cyrus, the Achaemenid, certainly we see the evidence that Assyrian people existed. They are referred to. There are Assyrians working even in Babylon, in Uruk, and other cities. Their names carry their identity. They are identified as Assyrians. And that's something that shows us that the Assyrian people continued in terms of archaeological evidence and textual evidence during this period of time. The core of the Neo-Babylonian Empire consisted of three areas. As I said, Ekhad represented the southern area, the sea land or very southern area, which sometimes had been known as Somar, Somar and Ekhad, represented the very southern tip of the area known as Babylonia. And again, Babylonia is a term that was used largely during Greek and Roman times. So it's a term that's uh, anachronistic to Mesopotamian history, but it exists, of course, and sometimes I will use it. But I just want you to know, as students of Assyrian history, that Babylonia is an artificial imposed term on Mesopotamia. It's not a term that existed. Assyria, or Mat Ashur, did exist. Babylonia, as a term, did not exist. Babylonia, as a reference to Ekhad, course, existed. The other area that was the core of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, or what is known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire, is Assyria, a very clearly defined area 
ranging from the area of or the city of Ashur, going all the way up past northern Nineveh and into the hilly country beyond, and also towards the west, uh, towards the cities of Haran and Durkafimu, and we'll, we'll refer to the city of Durkafimu today. And then towards the east, to the city of Kirkuk and Arbella. Now, even though many of the Assyrian cities were destroyed, such as Nineveh and Nimrud and Ashur, and Tarvishu, which was a center for Assyrian kings uh, to be prepped, Tarvishu, just north of the city of Nineveh, which has not been excavated, the city of Erbil, which was toward the east of Nineveh, was never destroyed. In fact, it wasn't destroyed at all. There is no a damage found archaeologically, and this is a very ancient Assyrian city, inhabited up until this very day today. When you look at the city of Arbella and look at the what's called the citadel of Arbel, know that you are looking at a, an elevated part of the city that contained the temples and the palace of the Assyrian king or the ruling administration. The rest of the ancient city of Arbella surrounds that citadel that you see on a map. So when we get done today, I want you to go and take a look at the Google Earth screenshot of the city of Erbil, and you will notice that in the very center of it, as you scan closer, you will see that this is the citadel area, which is the temples, contained the temples and the um, palace of the Assyrian rulers, the administrative center of the city, the heart of the city. But remember, the walls of the city, which are unfortunately buried beneath various buildings now surrounding the citadel area are a much larger circumference than the citadel. So it's not only that the citadel is the old Assyrian town, the entire city, much larger than the citadel area, is the city of Erbil. Now, in terms of what remained of Assyria after its destruction, we have a city by the name of Dur Kathimu. This city has given us archaeological evidence of Assyrian continuity. What does that mean? It means that after the fall of Nineveh and after the fall of Haran in 609 BC, Assyrian administration continued. This means that we have archaeological evidence for the continuity of Assyrian history, the continuity of the writing of the Assyrians in the style of the Assyrian Empire. As Assyria's state structure began to collapse, sections of Assyrian army retreated to the western part of the empire and continued to exist and maybe even fight for quite a number of years, probably into the 500s BC, so long after the fall of Nineveh. And the cities that continued to possibly have resistance, certainly administration, were Haran and Dur Kathimu. Dur Kathimu is a very interesting town in particular because it shows that Assyrian administration went on during the time of Nebuchadnezzar II in the Neo-Babylonian period, what we call the Neo-Babylonian period. So excavations in this city, in particular by a man, an archeologist, a very capable archeologist by the name of Harmut, ha, uh, Hartmut Kuhn, who is a German uh, Assyriologist, shows that the pottery and the material culture of the ancient Assyrians continued on long after the fall of the empire. And in a very wonderful lecture at the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute, this professor said that what we know about the fall of Assyria and the understanding of its destruction after its fall, has to be reevaluated. We have to look again 
because the, the archaeological evidence shows that what we thought we knew about the so-called disappearance of the Assyrian people now is in ruins. This idea is in ruins. No pun intended here. And some Assyriologists now say this period that we call the post-Assyrian period after the fall should be reevaluated because material culture, pottery, and so on shows that Assyrian continuity went on after the fall. And in particular, something called the Red House, called the Red House because of the pottery there, um, or the color, I guess, is showing us that the Neo-Assyrian period continued on in terms of the archaeological evidence that we found. And there you see a photograph on your left of what's called the Red House in the area of Durkathimu, which is on the Chaba River. Uh, in the, um, and, and it's also called Sheikh Ahmed, Tel Sheikh Ahmed, in Syria. Unfortunately, these areas have been invaded by fundamentalist uh, armies, and uh, they've done a lot of damage in these areas. And this is a very critical period of Syrian history, which archaeologists hopefully in the future will come back to. So our understanding of the fall of Assyria previously, let's say for many of the historians of Assyria, was that Assyria was destroyed, the Assyrian people had really disappeared. Now, after we dug up all of this evidence, we have to reevaluate that position because we see that Assyrian culture continued on long after the fall. And a lot of the sites which have not yet been dug up according to one Assyrian mayor in the city of Baghdadi, over 26 sites have been identified in the city of Baghdadi itself, in the Nineveh Plain. Over 26 sites are linked to the ancient Assyrian period. And possibly those can show, because the city is inhabited and possibly was inhabited, you know, right after the fall and continued on during Persian times and so on, these tells Assyrian ruins can possibly shed light on the Assyrian period, which continued on during the Achaemenids, during the Neo-Babylonian period, Achaemenid period, and possibly Seleucid period that came afterwards, after the invasion by Alexander the Great. So one professor, a Krepner, uh, Dr. Florian Krepner tells us that if the period after 612 BC is to be labeled, one should avoid a term like post Assyrian, which implies a change of material culture or even ethnic groups. It should refer only to historical changes because it is the time after the fall of the Neo Assyrian Empire in northern Mesopotamia. So, really, what we're looking at here is the collapse of a governmental structure not the destruction of a people. In other words, the people, the culture, the material culture, the faith continued on. As we'll see, this is in agreement with many archaeologists and Assyriologists now. And this is a photograph of some of the tablets that were found in dur going back to the Middle Assyrian period and all the way up into the Neo-Assyrian period and after the fall of Assyria. So this shows very clear continuity for centuries of Assyrian existence in this part of the world. After the fall of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, after the Neo-Babylonian Empire had its last king defeated, we unfortunately do not know of his fate after the defeat and the arrival of the Persian or the Achaemenid Empire. Assyrians are represented in both images and in written records during the Achaemenid Empire. And Assyria is referred to as Athura, oftentimes. Later, it is referred to as Asuristan. This is on your left is an image of Assyrians supposedly bearing gifts to the Persian king, to the Achaemenid king. 
and uh, we will see again images of Assyrians um, sort of paying tribute to the Persian king. Cyrus and the Achaemenids inherit Assyrian power as Cyrus becomes the king of the lands, a title that the ancient Assyrian kings use. The Persians, where the Neo-Babylonian Empire, one could say, did not style themselves in the manner of the Assyrian kings very specifically, the Persians did, the Achaemenids did. And so according to a number of historians, the history of the title, its explicit universalist ambition, and its almost immediate application after the siege of Babylon, all suggest that Cyrus was seen or made himself to be seen as heir to Assyria's world dominance very early in his reign. Rather than underscoring continuity with the practices of the Babylonian or Neo-Babylonian Empire, the adoption of the title speaks of a new vision for Babylon, a vision that imagines Cyrus as the political and cultural successor of the Assyrians. This ascription to Assyrian royal ideology particularly that of Ashurbanipal, is well known from the Cyrus Cylinder and other royal inscriptions that Cyrus left in Babylonia. The adoption of the title, the king of the lands, therefore fits a wider program that seeks to communicate Babylon's dependence on a new world order modeled after the Assyrian Empire. The Achaemenids, in other words, continued the Assyrian tradition continued the world empire tradition that the Assyrians had built. In addition to the continuity of the Assyrian system, Cyrus had allowed the Assyrians back their, I don't want to say idols, but the images of, of their gods. And he tells us from Babylon, I sent back to their places to the sanctuaries across the river Tigris, whose shrines had earlier become dilapidated, reference to, among others, the, the uh, shrine of Ashur. The gods who lived therein to Ashur, I made permanent sanctuaries for them. I collected together all of their people and returned them to their settlements. And this, again, I mean, in addition to referring to the Assyrians being allowed, certain Assyrians, of course, not everybody left or was made to leave the land of Assyria, because this is a kind of a reference um, to some Assyrians who may have been living in Babylon or in Uruk and other cities being allowed to go back after the fall of Assyria. It may have been a certain class of Assyrians, perhaps Assyrians who were aristocrats and who were punished by um, Neo-Babylonians for being in the aristocratic class of Assyrians and taken to other cities, in other words, deported in the same style that Assyrians had punished particular aristocracies in other countries. In addition to this, it shows the style of Assyrian rulership. Assyrians, when they took over in certain cities, Hostile cities, they would, as a token of compassion and justice, and of course, good PR, allow certain people to go back, replace certain shrines. Ashurbanipal and Sarhaddon and Sennacherib and other Assyrian kings, Sargon II, did this as a gesture of goodwill towards people. So Assyrian kings also did what you see here Cyrus doing. Not to be certainly described as only a kind empire, so that we understand empires can be very cruel and ruthless, Xerxes uh, punished Babylon severely. And Xerxes, um, after a rebellion by Babylon, took away its god. Punished Babylon after the uprisings of Shavash Eriba. Uh, by taking away the statue of Marduk from its sanctuary, by preventing further celebration of the Kitu festival, by destroying the city, not all of it, certainly, by eliminating the element of king of Babylon, in other words, the title 
from his official title and by splitting the satrapy of Babylon and across the river into smaller units. This was one way of dealing with a rebellious city, and the other way was, of course, allowing certain people who had settled in the city to leave, who may not have been originally from the city. So this is the style of the Persian kings. It's not what, as I referred to in the earlier lecture, that the Assyrians were thought to be overly cruel and the Persians thought to be overly kind, an impression that certain people have in history, certainly not based on the evidence. The evidence shows that Persian kings or Achaemenid kings continued in the style of Assyrian kings and ruled really artistically, textually, administratively, really based on the Assyrian style long, many years long after the fall of Assyria. Assyrians not only survived, but also served in the Achaemenid military, and Assyria was prosperous during this time. Assyrian soldiers, along with Lydians, who were from Anatolia, constituted the main heavy infantry of the Achaemenid military, despite the fact that some scholars think Assyria was a wasteland during this period. Archaeology and historical evidence can, uh, shows otherwise. John Curtis and Seymour Parpola, in particular, noted that Assyria would eventually become one of the wealthiest regions among the Achaemenid Empire, within the Achaemenid Empire. This wealth was due to the land's great prosperity for agriculture that the Achaemenids used effectively for almost 200 years. So, was Assyria a wasteland during the reign of the Persians, certainly not. Assyria continued on. Its people continued to live in Assyria. Assyrian identity, as we will see, and Assyrian culture continued long into the reign of the Achaemenids. And this is a point made by one of my favorite Assyrian Assyria, or Assyriologists, not Assyrian, but Assyriologists. I guess he could be an honorary Assyrian who tells us that the, the political power of Assyria was gone. In other words, the, the state structure was gone, but its people, culture, and religion lived on. In marked contrast to the resolute integration policy of the Neo-Assyrian kings, the Achaemenid did not interfere with the internal affairs of their satrapies or states, as long as the flow of tribute and taxes continued undisturbed. This was no problem in Assyria, whose population continued to venerate the great king, in other words, the Persian king, as the source of peace and security for themselves. The Aramaic sayings of Achita, a popular collection of wisdom composed in the Neo-Syrian period, praised fear of God and king as the highest moral virtue. And by the way, this continued on long, long after the, the Achaemenid period into, I would say, even modern day Assyrian psychology. At the same time being set at the Assyrian royal court, they continued to boost the Assyrian identity of the population. The Achaemenids, who themselves were significantly Assyrianized, according to Simo Parpola, and as you see in their artwork and their administration, the Achaemenids felt no need to change the existing realities in the land of Assyria. The Assyrian Aramaic alphabet, or the Aramaic alphabet, all the Assyrian script now continued to be used. The existence of Assyria went on just as before, Simo tells us. According to Parpola, Imperial Aramaic continued as the lingua franca of the empire, the Aramaic script, now called the Assyrian script. And up until this day, even the rabbis in the Jewish faith referred to their own script as Kitab Ashuri. And we know that after the fall of the Assyrian Empire, there are references by Greeks, Persians, Egyptians to the script as the Assyrian script. This was the everyday writing system. Local religions and cults were tolerated during the reign of the Achaemenids, and the judicial system, calendar, and imperial standards imposed by the Assyrians remained in force everywhere. 
Thus, Syria continued on being a part of the Achaemenid Empire, but retaining its culture and faith. So although Assyria did not have a structure ruling it, there was no longer an empire, there was no longer a major military force, Assyria and its people continued on. Achaemenid rule, according to Simo Corpola, preserved the Assyrian identity. The 210 years of Achaemenid rule thus helped preserve the Assyrian identity of the Aramaic-speaking peoples, including Assyrians, most notably Assyrians. Although the times of Assyrian hegemony were over, Assyria stayed on, uh, on the map as a political entity and its inhabitants as Assyrians in the eyes of the contemporary world. And by the way, I need to stop here and sort of address a point that is often made by certain people who insist that it, although Assyria was gone, there was something else that should be referred to as Aramean, this entity Aramean. Nowhere in Persian records, Achaemenid records, do we see a reference to Assyria being Aramean or Aram. We just do not see that. Paradoxically, the period of massacres and persecutions following the fall of Nineveh seemed to have strengthened their national and ethnic identity. So in other words, Assyrian identity. The last king of Babylon, Nabonidus, who was of Assyrian extraction, reverted to Assyrian royal titulary and style in his inscriptions and openly promoted Assyrian religion and culture meaning the cult of Sin in particular, evidently as a chauvinistic reaction against the Chaldean dynasty or the Neo-Babylonian dynasty, which would be more accurate, for which he had usurped power. No wonder the Greek historian Herodotus and Xenophon remembered him as an Assyrian king. So Assyrian culture continued on during the entire reign of the Achaemenids, which was 210 years until Alexander came. And according to historian John Curtis, classical authors imply that the Assyrian countryside was prosperous. We must certainly move away from the idea that Assyria was a wasteland. Northern Iraq is potentially rich agriculturally, something that one can see up until today. And even though quality of the harvest is dependent on the spring and rainfall, it is in a good year it can be excellent. It is unlikely that this rich agricultural potential was not exploited. And as we see, the historical record shows that Assyria in fact survived and the Achaemenids were better for it because it allowed them grain um, supplies that are needed for military operations and as wealth, of course. Before the Neo-Babylonian Empire emerged under the leadership of Nablusar in the seventh century, territories from the Eastern Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf had been under Assyrian rule for a century. The Neo-Assyrian period was decisive for many later developments, a state formation in Palestine. The use of Aramaic can the use of Aramaic as an administrative language in the Babylonian practice of mass deportations were all influenced by the Assyrians. So it was continued on, um, this period of time continued on uh, carrying the Assyrian influence during the what is known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire. So what we see here is very clearly the continuity of not only the Assyrian people, but the Assyrian style of ruling into the Neo-Babylonian period and into very prominently, more prominently, um, into the uh, Achaemenid period. And so again, the style of rulership, just so you do understand that the continuity was very clear from Assyrian times and there was no disruption in terms of let's say the cruelty that was used, or let's say expressions of cruelty, you see here in terms of Darius making the statement in a historical source regarding a Mede who had rebelled 
I cut off his nose and ears and tongue and put out an eye. He was kept bound at my palace entrance. All of the people saw him. Afterward, I impaled him. And the men who were his foremost followers, uh, those at Ekbatana, within the fortress, I flayed and hung out their hides stuffed with straw. All right, so not a very nice, kind expression when we compare him with Assyrian king, an Assyrian king. So in other words, this type of use of this rhetoric continued on well into the Persian Empire, as well as sort of the kind expressions of Cyrus and other Persian kings in allowing people to live their lives as long as they did not rebel was really a continuity of the Assyrian period or the Assyrian style of rule. And the Persian Empire, after 200 some years, comes to an end in 330, Alexander, known as Alexander the Great, conquers the Achaemenid Empire and does a great deal of damage to Persepolis, one of the greatest uh, cities in the ancient Near East. But certainly loots it and burns it. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we will hear that the destruction was very typical for the Assyrians to destroy a certain city. Well, here we see Alexander do this over and over again in the Near East. In other words, he wreaks destruction to many of the cities and to many of the peoples in the Middle East. Although he's known as Alexander the Great, he was really no different in terms of dealing with rebels, people who did not surrender, than many of the rulers who had ruled before in the ancient Near East. In other words, there is really here no, oh, he's a Western ruler, he's different than sort of the cruel Orientals, he does not rule any differently than others. The records show or the historical record shows. Now, Assyrians are oftentimes attested to during these periods, and especially by writers who, who happen to be Greek and Roman. The country of the Assyrians borders on Persia and Susiana. This name, Assyria, is given to Babylonia and to much of the country all around, which latter in part is also called Aturia. And this is the Greek geographer uh, Strabo and historians. He also tells us, mean by the Syrians, no other people than those who built the royal palaces in Babylon and Ninos or Nineveh. And these Syrians, or Assyrians, uh, of these uh, Syrians, King Ninos was the man who founded Ninos in Aturia. And his wife, Samiramis, was the woman who succeeded her husband and founded Babylon. And of course, we have to kind of contextualize this properly. The Greeks got much Assyrian history wrong, but they certainly got reference to the Syrians and Assyrians. A little bit confused, but they're referring to the same people. The term Syrian really comes from Assyria. Sima Perpola tells us this. The self-designation of modern Syriacs and Assyrians in other words, members of the Syriac Orthodox Church and members of the Church of the East or others who associate with the word Assyrian, derived from the Neo-Syrian word for Assyrian, which is Ashurayu or Surayu. So this really shows us that the word Syrian, which oftentimes was used by Greeks for Assyrian, is really the same word. And although it became separate, and we will refer to this we will refer to this topic because it's not our sole topic today. We will refer to this topic in the future to understand that the word Suraya among Assyrians is really a reference not to Christians, as some people would have us believe, but really to the word Assyrian. Why? Because in the Assyrian language, the reference to the word Christian is really Mshichaya, not necessarily Suraya. So Suraya is really an ethnic designation. But because of the context that the Assyrians lived in, everyone who was Christian and spoke the same language became also, in effect, a Christian. 
Now, I want to tell you in a few minutes and give you a chance to ask your questions, what happened to the Assyrian people long after the fall of Assyria, long after the coming of the Achaemenids and uh, the empires that came afterwards. So I want to sort of have us connect ourselves on the ground here, the Assyrians that are left in Assyria, connected back to history. After many, many centuries of devastation, it is incredible to find that the Assyrian people are still surviving, whether identifying themselves as Syrians or not, still speaking the same language, practicing a culture that is similar to the ancient Assyrian culture and a culture that we all share today, and really living on the ruins. And I want to explain to you that there are many ruins today in Assyria still. It's unfortunate that this area of the world is still being contested by various powers. Specifically, in the Nineveh Plain, we have a, the Kurdistan regional government on the one hand from the northern part and the PMF, which is the paramilitary forces belonging to the Iraqi government, but really associated with the government of Iran, covering sort of what we know as the southern area of the Nineveh Plain. So the larger area of the Nineveh Plain today falls under the reign of the PMF, which is the paramilitary forces supported by Iran. Despite this, and despite the horrors of ISIS in 2014 and 2015 and 2016 and the destruction of many of the exposed Assyrian ruins and churches and monasteries and the harassment and persecution of Assyrian people who had converted to Christianity, of course, soon after the arrival of the Christian faith into the area of Assyria, into Erbil, Nineveh, and other areas, the Assyrians still survive in the thousands. And when you visit these towns, knowing what you know today, that this area is the heartland of a very ancient culture and civilization, you appreciate the fact that these people are still there, despite all of the hardship, despite the persecution, despite the continued harassment by various forces. It is quite inspiring, all the more tragic, really, what's happened in the past, but it is quite inspiring to see children who are still smiling. And I want to leave you with a quote that I shared with a few of my friends from Michael Sarafa, who is an attorney in Detroit, who expresses his identity as Chaldean, but who, of course, understands the link to his past as Syrian. He wrote this to a few of his friends, and it was quoted in social media after he took a photograph of these two young children in the heartland of Assyria, in the town of Tilkepe, which means, by the way, Tilkepe, Mound of Rocks, which is an ancient Assyrian town. Men, I continue to look at this picture. When I pulled out my camera, both of the little guys pulled their arms behind their backs, straightened their shoulders, and stood up straight. They were happy to pose, but there's a sadness in their eyes. They know we are people from the other side, presumably a better side with more promise and opportunity. Sometimes I think our Chaldean community in the US has gone astray, that we forgot our roots. All of us are only one or two generations away from being them. Many of the people who came from Turkey, from the heartland of Assyria, went and lived in Michigan, and they've been going there since the 1950s, actually much earlier than that, but especially since the 1980s, and especially when Iraq was under the sanctions 
of the United States. And after they entered Detroit, they succeeded, of course, in building up a great amount of wealth. The Chaldean or Assyrian community in Detroit today has tremendous resources. It has many, many millionaires. And many people have left this town, and there are no longer, it's very hard to find people who are still original, the original people of Tikef and living in Tikef. But here you have these two children who are very proud and, according to Michael Sarafa, connected to us, but really through one or two generations. And he sees sadness in their eyes because he feels a disconnection a disconnect between them and himself. And I think that disconnect also comes from a lack of understanding of history. And one of the things we try to do in this class is to connect ourselves with our past, both tragic and glorious past. And I really think it's very important to understand this history and this land in the context of a longer period than just what happened during ISIS, uh, the time of ISIS in 2014 and slightly afterwards. And to understand it gives you a greater appreciation for what is there and who is there and who they are and, and what their identity is and how this is connected to a very ancient past and what this should mean in terms of not only the existence of a collective entity, such as the Assyrians are, but also in terms of their political rights, their economic entitlements, um, and so on. 